to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com where you can find our entire back catalog of over 100 episodes on research computing, high-performance computing, and scientifics, uh, anything. Um, I have again with us Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. Yeah, this is always great stuff. I always love to learn uh, new random things over the people that and projects that we run into on the internet. So, with that, I don't think we really actually even have any announcements today, so why don't you just tell us what we got on tap for today? Okay, okay so today we have two people from the, I think it's referred to as Deal 2 project. Um, so guys, why don't you go ahead and take a moment to introduce yourselves. Yeah, so I'm Wolfgang Bangers. I'm a, uh, I'm a professor at Colorado State, and um, some 20 years ago I was um, stubborn enough to not like the software choices that were out there and just um, decided to write my own. And uh, that turned into a 20-year-long project that I still maintain. That's Deal 2. And my name is Timo Heister. I'm an assistant professor in mathematical sciences at Clemson University in South Carolina. And uh, I've been involved with the Deal 2 project for a couple of years now. And uh, became a maintainer uh, when I did my postdoc uh, together with Wolfgang. So give us the elevator pitch. What is Deal 2? Sure. So um, Deal 2 is a, um, a, a member of the um, great lineage of software libraries that we've been doing in uh, computational science. So think about um, that's something that starts with BLAS and LAPAC and then Linear algebra libraries came along like Petsy and Trillinos that were on this podcast before. And then sometime in the early 2000s, people started to build um, finite element libraries. So finite elements is something that we use typically to solve uh, partial differential equations in continuum mechanics. So for, let's say, sonic mechanics problems or for uh, flow problems. And um, there's sort of a, um, a common set of tools that you need to um, have to build these sort of um, code. So you need to have meshes, for example. You need to have descriptions of what we call finite elements. You need to have linear and nonlinear solvers. And all of these sort of things is what we put into Deal 2. So I, I, I should say this. It's... Um, it's a, um, a library written in C++. It's um, got about a million lines of code. Um, it's probably one of the bigger ones in this field. Um, it's got a fairly sizable community of a few hundred people who use it. Um, that's, that's sort of the 30,000 feet view of Deal 2. All right, so for those of us who are not in the field, give us a little more on, you know, what are these finite element analysis things? What are partial differential equations, and why do we need software packages for them? Okay, so uh, partial differential equations um, describe um, things uh, in, in physics, right? They, they, are, they, are, they describe relationships of, uh, of functions and, for example, in forces and, and other kinds of things. And um, the finite element method is a way to solve these differential equations numerically on a computer. And uh, the interesting thing about finite elements is that, that it's, it's even in the name, it's finite element analysis, is that it has uh, a very strong mathematical foundation. So now you mentioned, uh, or actually Wolfgang mentioned, uh, a bunch of different numerical packages out there. Why are there different ones? And, and why do we have packages for these anyway? Why is, there, is it hard to write software like this? Yes. <laughs> It's um, and and it's uh, repetitive and redundant if everybody does it themselves, right? Um, that's that's why we have these packages and had them since well, you know, the 1950s in uh, in Fortran, right? Uh, so um, what we do in Deal Two is not redundant to what let's say Chile, Nas, and Petsy do in the linear algebra realm, and it's not redundant to what uh, let's say Blas and Lapak do for the dense linear algebra, right? They all built on top of each other. And um, I think what we as a community have just learned is that over the last, you know, 30 years, we built libraries on, on, at higher and higher levels, right? That we started with dense linear algebra, and then we started to build libraries for um, sparse linear algebra and for parallel linear algebra, and then people started to write libraries for uh, partial differential equations. And now there's libraries for, um, you know, uncertainty quantification and these sort of things. That, so they, they built sort of a stack where um, you can describe problems at a higher and higher level. 
Uh, and of course, all of them are, let's say, their own speciality, their own their own special area of computational science, where you have to have you know specialized knowledge. So, it, um, not everybody understands how exactly to implement, let's say, a GMRS um, iterative solver, and not everybody understands how to implement finite elements, and not everybody has to, because now we have all of these libraries that provide these sort of functionalities in in a more or less generic way that people who are not specialists can use them. So, so you've thrown around a lot of different things. You mentioned PDEs, but, it, it, you know, just walking around floors at places like supercomputing and stuff, people will normally think of finite element as FEA, and that means just structures calculations, um, end user codes uh, that we're familiar with for structures calculations. It sounds like that's not really the case. It sounds like FEA is just a method to solving a specific set of equations? Uh, yeah, that's right. So, um uh, the finite element method is is a way to solve all kinds of partial differential equations. So it could be in fluid dynamics, it could be in solid mechanics, it could be geosciences, magnetohydrodynamics, any kind of multi-physics problems, uh, nuclear physics, astrophysics, and I could go on and on. So all kinds of physical phenomena that can be described by these PDEs. So give us a little bit of background. Um, you're talking about well-developed libraries and code reusability. What prompted you to develop a new FEA software library? What's the history? Yeah, so um, I started this when I was um, doing my diploma thesis, so that's something like a master's thesis in Germany in 1998. And um, at the time, you know, a lot of these libraries that we have today, 18 years, 19 years later, uh, they didn't exist, right? Um, I mean, Petsy was just so invented. Lots and Lapak was there, but there were really not um, not a lot of libraries for this out there. And a lot of research groups were um, sort of starting to get into this field and were writing their own software libraries. And in the group that I was in, in Heidelberg, in Germany, there were a couple of libraries that were written by people who were uh, really good mathematicians and maybe not such good uh, software designers. And um, so I, I, I'm one of those people who um, grew up in the late 80s uh, as a teenager. So I had access to computers from when I was 14 or 15. And I had spent a lot of time programming. So um, when I became a, um, a, a master's student or then a PhD student, I sort of had a background in software design. And I saw that the software libraries that are out there um, were not, not all that well designed because the people didn't have a background in it. And then I probably also was more stubborn than most others. And I decided, well, you know, to heck, to hell with this. And I, um, I just decided I'll rewrite um, the functionality that was already there and put that into a software library that that I could con build and, and shape and form the way I wanted it to. And um, that turned out to be a really useful thing because at the time, like I said, there, were, there was nothing there that was, I mean, let's say the World Wide Web wasn't really there. So when we put this onto a website, um, because we could, so that was in 2000, we put it on a, on a website because that's what everybody was doing at the time because websites were new. And um, it turned out that people actually um, liked that and downloaded it and started to use it. And so we built a whole community of people around this that um, now contains, you know, a few dozen people who contribute code every quarter or so. And um, so it's, it's, um, it, it was a little bit of an accident of being too stubborn to use uh, what was there and wanting to do it right and then come up with a design that apparently seems to work even 20 years later. So before we go too much further, I do want to ask, where did the, where did the name come from? Deal.ii. Yeah. So that, um, you, you have to attribute that to somebody who was 26 or 27 at the time. Um, maybe not, uh, not the professional. So there, there was a library that was called deal at the time. That was the differential equations analysis library. And, um, that's the one that I replaced. And so we needed to come up with something that well, um, had a different name, but I liked the acronym DEAL. Um, so we wanted to make it DEAL2, and then we just needed to come up with a, with a catchy way of, of doing it. So we say DEAL and then a Roman 2 behind it. That's, that's where that name comes from. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let me ask another history question then, too. So back in the late 90s and whatnot, uh, this – that was kind of the bad old times for C++ compilers because there was so much new going on and the 
C++ compilers were a mishmash of supporting different uh, versions of various features in the language, and they weren't always very stable. Um, I remember because I did some C++ work in the MPI area in the mid to late 90s, and it was it was kind of difficult. What inspired you to do DL2 in C++? So that um... – I mean, I knew the language. I had started using C++ in, I don't know, maybe 93 or so uh, with compilers that were even worse. Um, you could download the, the standard template library from HP at the time, and uh, there was no compiler that could actually compile it, or at least I didn't have access to any. Um, but I, I liked the ideas that were in there, and it was, um, I mean, you're exactly right. It was difficult at the time to um, to use that because with every version of the compiler, some code would break. Um, every compiler that you tried understood a different subset of um, of the language so um, it, it was uh, it was more challenging but it was also clearly a language that everybody was going to I mean um, y- you know you, you see that libraries like Petsy for example that are written in C are still object oriented and um, I mean C++ sort of codifies this this way of programming and I think in the PDE world um, that's just what everybody was doing. So I, I had access to a library that was called DiffPack at the time um, that came out of Norway that was written in C++. Um, MPI is easy to use via C. Um, Petsy was written in C. So a lot of that part of my community was actually going towards C++, and it was not the controversial choice. And I, I mean, every finite element library that's come up since then that is more or less generic is written in C++ as well. So is DL2, it's developed in C++, um, you've mentioned it's a library, is it also a standalone application that can be called as a library, or is it just a library you need to code or is part of other larger tools? So DL2 is a, is a library, so it's not an application, and we see it, we see it as um, something that provides building blocks that you need to, to write your own program. Of course, uh, we include tutorial programs that do something and... Uh, it's used by other people that write specific solvers to solve uh, specific problems. But DL2 itself is just a library that provides building blocks. Okay, so if you had to say there was a common use case for using DL2, what would you say that was? That's actually really diverse. So um, one of my favorite jobs is to go through the list of publications that cite us, and um, you find that there's people from fluid dynamics to um, solid mechanics to crazy applications. I mean, really things that we had never seen, um, that we had never heard of, and that's a lot of fun to see that. To add to that, I guess um, many of us, if not most of us, um, that are involved in the development use it uh, to do numerical methods research or finite element research. Um, set the blocks together and, and try out new methods or solvers and so on. Okay, and actually that's interesting to touch on right there. So in terms of the research itself, this may not be something that many people are even aware of that exists because in their mind when you write a solver or you write an equation, you're just literally taking symbols off of a sheet of paper or a blackboard and inputting it into a computer. But that's not what these solvers and things are, right? No, it's uh, it's quite complicated. And uh, I guess one of the issues is that you need a very um, wide range of different things to actually show that something that you're doing is working. So, um, I mean, the library doesn't just do finite elements. Um, to do finite elements, you need geometry, you need meshes, you need linear algebra, you need parallel computing, you need visualization, and so on and so on. So, um, so are there common like stacks that provide that? Like, what would be a either an application that provides all that? It's kind of like an end user application that someone can consume, or a common set of tools that work together that that DL two is inside of the solver and they probably don't even know. Yeah, so um, one example is uh, uh, a code called Aspect that is uh, uh, to do a simulation of um, mantle convection. So it's geosciences. Um, both of us are also working on that. So that builds on DL2. Uh, 
um, and uh, provides an application interface to do to do mental convection simulations. Another example is OpenFCST. That is a, um, a group that is developing a code that does fuel cell simulations, um, where also under the hood DL2 is used, but it's not visible to the user. Uh, so take a break here for a second. I actually want to jump back. I think there was another follow-up question that I should have asked right after the last one where I was saying it's not just copying mathematical formula into a computer. You have to actually implement it. Da, 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 da. Um, and then you gave the answer and then um, Brock jumped in there. And I, after a moment, I was like, oh, there's something I should ask on a follow up. So we're going to go back and splice this back in after the fact here, but pretend it's right after that. Um, and I want to ask you another question here. So I'll give it a beat of silence and I'll ask you. Okay, and kind of what I was going for, though, is that there's actually a lot of skill um, and – well, not just skill, but also research because it's not always known. Like to take this formula, uh, it takes an iterative method, and what is the best iterative method? And then actually how to implement that on a computer is actually a difficult problem sometimes too because just of uh, you're, you're kind of constrained in the way a von Neumann architecture works. And so, you know, the canonical example is if you do a matrix matrix multiply in the trivial three loop method that is horribly inefficient and terrible. And so there are, you know, much, much more complicated ways to do matrix matrix multiplication when you're running on a computer because those are much better matching for the underlying architecture. And so I would imagine that is a lot of what DL2 is that there's a lot of expertise and cutting edge research on how to solve these complex partial differential equations and other types of uh, problems in super efficient ways that your average developer doesn't know how to do. They would rather just call some kind of function in C++ and say, hey, here's my inputs, here's the structure of what I'm doing, please solve it for me. And then you go off and uh, that's where all the magic actually happens that you have spent years literally implementing. Is that a, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I think that's, that's actually pretty accurate. I mean, a, a lot of it, let's say, you know, in these sort of libraries, a lot of it is that you need to find the right data structures and the algorithms that work on it and um, then you provide the user with a, with a place where they can jump into um, your implementation of the algorithm and the data structure, but they will never see how it's actually done. That's, that's exactly what all of these libraries are about. And to cross over into my realm, because I do a lot of parallel computing kinds of things, uh, it, at least in some cases, you can actually parallelize the, the solvers behind the scenes too. So it's a type of thing where you can... The user calls a function saying solve this equation, and if they just happen to have, say, a 32-server cluster behind it, they might get the answer in that much faster time. Does that kind of effect happen as well? Yeah, so we we provide interfaces to parallel solvers, and, I mean, it requires you to write an extra 50 lines of code or so to, you know, say something about, well, so what kind of data do you actually locally need? So typically you split a vector um, across machines, but then each processor needs to know a little bit about uh, some piece of information from other processors, so ghost elements. So that part you need to say, what, what parts do you actually need? But the rest of it all works automatically. So if you want to split up a mesh with 100 million elements to 10,000 processors, that, that happens all under the hood. Um, but there's, of course, a few 10,000 lines of code behind that. So can I just... What you just did there sounded a lot like um, partitioning to me. Um, so can can people just pair this up with a something like Metis or something like that to be able to take their mesh and partition it, and does that come into a format that Deal can understand? Yeah, so, um, well, typically we start with, with meshes that are not partitioned and we do it ourselves. Um, and you can either do this with Metis, so Deal 2 has interfaces to Metis, um, but you can, what we typically use is a library that's called pforest that is specific to uh, what we call adaptively refined meshes. Um, so pforest really has tested all of these things out to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of processors and does exactly the sort of thing that we need for partitioning of meshes. Okay, so, so what I'm really hearing here is this, 
DL2 is really scoped to. It is just a finite element solver package and all the other things you need to be able to take your real world problem a uh, physical geometry or whatever it is discretize it, turn it to a mesh, apply properties, partition it, distribute it among processors that's all other functionality that comes from other projects out there like Metis um, as well as is on the user's part to make that functionality specific for whatever their physical properties are. Yeah, so, so we implement a lot of these, let's say, the, the, the specifics of these data structures um, in DL2. So, you know, oftentimes you need to store information on a cell, for example. Um, and that's something that we implement ourselves. But, for example, partitioning is something that can be described in a very abstract and generic way. And that's the sort of thing that we typically import from other libraries. Because there's people out there who are so much better at this than what we could possibly do, right? Um, it's, it, it would be a shame to re-implement what they already did. So you talked a bit about the parallelism there. What kind of parallelism do you support? Is it shared memory parallelism or uh, distributed memory parallelism, like MPI style, or or what? So we we do all of this. We uh, we use MPI for the very large computations because that's basically the only thing you have out there if you want to do. Um, scientific computing on distributed memory machines, but then we also support um, threads on multi-core machines. So if you want to do things on typical laptops, let's say with eight, eight cores, then you would use multi-threading for that. Um, we've played a little bit with GPUs, and that um, in our community has not really been found to be very useful so far. Uh, so you mentioned GPUs there. Have you tried any other type of accelerator, like FPGA, Xeon Phi, something like that, because some of them have different architectures. Yeah, so we, we played on, on the Xeon files, and but I think ultimately for the sort of things that we do, not just we, but, but the community has struggled with this because we often work with really complicated data structures. And ultimately, I think it comes down to if you have simple data structures, then GPUs and accelerators are a great tool. But if you work on, let's say, sparse matrices and um, you know complicated mesh data structures, what we find is that it's just really difficult to put them onto GPUs in any way that makes it efficient. Um, I mean, we can we can match the same speed that we have from the CPU, but we don't really gain very much. So, do you guys get a chance to play on some of you know any of the new and upcoming architectures? So, we talked about the Xeon Phi's, we talked about accelerators, but what about things that are coming down the horizon, like processors and memory? and 3D memory, and do SSDs, like the, the fast RAM kinds of things, do they play an into effect? And I, I realize this goes more into the uh, software and computer engineering side of things rather than the mathematical research side of things. But just the fact that the architecture of some of our compute machines is actually changing a bit, and does that affect how you write your methods and algorithms? Yeah, so in, in some ways, of course. I mean, we um, we try, for example, to parallelize with threads many operations that we that we do. I think a lot of the technologies that you that you mentioned really require sort of access at a lower level on, on simpler data structures. And so the typical place where I would say this has a this plays a role is let's say in linear solvers, um, where let's say we created the, the the linear systems in DL2 and then we hand it off to libraries like Petsy and Trilinos, who may hand it off to some other thing that works at a lower level that can use all of these sort of things. So that's sort of how we see that that ecosystem working, that um, at least we hope that we can offload these sort of things on to other libraries. So how does one, you know, as a user or a consumer of this library, how do you learn about these kinds of things, not only from the mathematical perspective, but from the API perspective and whatnot, too? Because I would imagine documentation takes you so far, but then how do you get to the next level to become an actually proficient DL2 user? Documentation is a really important part of the DL2 project. Um, we spend a lot of time on writing documentation in various forms. Um, we have now, I think, 57 tutorial programs that highlight certain things and explain parts of the library and how it is supposed to be used. 
Um, and we have a lot of other documentation about all the functionality of the API and so on. Um, that said, uh, Wolfgang has been uh, recording uh, video lectures, and he can probably tell you about that. Yeah, so this is a, this was an experiment I did for a class of mine where I just wanted to flip the classroom, and then it sort of got out of control. So I recorded these lectures that, um, you know, the idea was to present the material, but then also to show interactively how you work with DL2. And as a matter of fact, with other tools as well. So I show how to use Git and how to use uh, Visit and Pair. Well, together we recorded something on Pair View. So it was more, more the idea to uh, give, you know, newcomers to the field the opportunity to look over the shoulders of people who've been doing this for many years and, and how to see how they interact with something. And that turns out to be a really useful tool, apparently, to learn how to use DL2 as well. Let's look a little bit more. I, I'm, I'm not familiar with FEA myself. I was actually one of those people who thought FEA meant you're just simulating cars crashing into walls. Um, besides numerically solving a PDE, with FEA, is there, a, is there an alternative? Like, what would you say, if someone's trying to solve a PDE, is FEA the only way to do it numerically on a computer, or are there other methods out there, and what are they? There's many different ways um, on how to numerically solve uh, PDEs. So you might, you might be, you or the, the listener might be familiar with the finite difference method. Um, that's probably the easiest to teach and the easiest to get into. Um, but there's many other ways to do this. There's uh, finite volumes, and there's also uh, meshless methods that don't that don't base their discretization on meshes. Um, so mesh-free methods, radial basis functions. Um, there's uh, isogeometric analysis, um, which is may maybe less known, but finite element is just one of the methods. Is it is finite element like extremely generic and applies for like many different forms of PDEs and these other ones are more specific or like how would someone choose to use DL2, a FEA library versus a different library that's implementing one of these other methods? Sure. So I mean it depends a lot on the equation that you that you want to solve. So the, I would say that over the last you know twenty years or so we've basically figured out that the finite element method is really just a generalization of finite differences. And you can see it also as a generalization of finite volumes if you want to. But nevertheless, so for uh, problems, for example, that are high-speed flow, so everything that is um, strictly hyperbolic, I think today we understand that the finite volume method is probably the way to go. Whereas for everything that's not hyperbolic, so for static problems or for problems that, you know, where, where there's transport of information in every direction. So let's say, you know, elastostatic problems or elastodynamic problems. Um, so for these sort of things, it turns out that um, the finite element method is actually pretty good and can be applied to a lot of different applications because it sort of gives a conceptual framework of how to approach these problems. So let's go in a slightly different direction here. Let's talk about something I think you made an offhand remark about earlier, the software engineering aspect of all of this, uh, the design and the testing and the validation of it. Because when you create these numerical libraries, uh, not only are you doing it more efficiently, but you also do want to make sure you're actually giving correct answers. Can you give us a little insight on how you do you know, how do you prepare for a release? How do you actually verify that your software is giving correct answers across all these, you know, variety of different types of uh, solvers and methods and things like that? Sure. Um, that's a very important part. Um, there's several ways to, to approach this. There's or, or several kinds of tests that are, that are happening. There are tests that you can, uh, you can do based on the theory of the finite element method. So you uh, expect certain convergence orders or certain behavior, and you can verify that that works. Um, but we also uh, need to do uh, like the, the standard software testing of the API if the data structures are correct and so on. So we have a test suit um, with about 8,000 tests that we, that we run continuously. So we do a continuous integration. We run nightly tests with many different configurations and different libraries and uh, make sure that stuff that, that worked at some point uh, still works. <laughs> 
Now, do you find that your software performs the same way on different types of architectures, such as, you know, every every 18 months or whatever, we get a new chip from Intel and AMD has an entirely different line of chips. And do you support things other than Linux? Do you support OS X? Uh, sorry, I asked a bunch of questions in there, but just more on this engineering side of things about, you know, the verification of do I get the same result if I run the same program under OS X on my Mac versus over MPI on a cluster of, you know, 32 servers? It is difficult. Um, and to add to that, it's not only the different architectures, it's also just different compilers, right? Um, you compile something with the Intel compiler and it will do different optimization. And uh, the problem is that all these computations that we do uh, are floating point computations that um, might be slightly different. So testing these is a little bit of a, is a, little bit of a challenge. Um, but uh, there's ways to do that um, with tolerances and so on. And um, yeah, Wolfgang, do you want to mention uh, our cross-platform support? Yeah, so I mean, you know, it, it's a challenge to make this happen, but by and large, I think we're actually pretty good at this. So uh, we have a lot of people who use Macs. Uh, we have a lot of people who use any different number of uh, Linux distributions. Um, we, we, we've run on basically every cluster there is. So, you know, you, you adapt to this and you, you have your tools and your, uh, your procedures and, and ultimately, uh, you make it happen. It's just software maintenance. It's, it's not exciting stuff, but it but but you figure it out. So, what's the largest example of someone using DL two in practice? I'm not quite sure what you mean by largest. Uh, largest as in most number of users, or largest in the sense of the biggest parallel run that is that has been done. Uh, the biggest parallel run that's been done. Well, actually, probably not the number of processors. Probably the number of elements, right? The the total yes. size of the problem. Like, how far does this thing scale? Okay, so the biggest runs that we know of um, are probably done by a colleague and good friend uh, of ours, uh, Martin Kronwichler, and he has been running on the SuperMOOC in Munich in Germany, and on something like 150,000 cores, and the biggest problem, so when you talk finite elements, um, the interesting number is the number of unknowns um, is... Uh, in the order of 30 billion. Um, and so you're solving, so you're creating and solving a linear system that is 30 billion cross 30 billion. Um, so uh, a common question that we ask a lot of our guests is what, what's the strangest or most unexpected use of DL2 that you have seen? Yeah, that's fun, right? Um, when you do open source, you never know what people use your stuff for. So I've, um, there's a couple of papers um, that I really like. One um, simulates the deterioration of statues in Rome due to air pollution with DL2. And the other one is a paper that I think appeared in Nature um, that simulates the growth of plant roots. Also not something that I would have expected um, our software to be useful for. I'm sorry, just a, real quick. The growth of what? I missed that. Plant, plant roots. Um, oh, so plant are, roots. Oh. Yeah, so so I think it was wheat or or Arabidopsis or something of that sort. And what uh, license is DL2 distributed under? LGPL. Any particular reason you guys chose that? Um, that is um, that is a more complicated story. Um, so uh, it used to be uh, the QPL license, and I don't know why uh, Wolfgang and his colleagues originally chose that. But uh, we switched to LGPL a while ago um, because we wanted uh, more people to be able to use it and uh, make it more compatible with other things in the ecosystem. So normally we ask what is written in, but you mentioned it's written in C++. Do you have native bindings for other languages, Fortran, Java, Python? We've got a couple of people who are writing interfaces to Python, but that's slow. So the issue, I think, that... Um, we encounter is that a lot of DL2 is written with templates and uh, templates don't really match so well onto language or map well onto languages that don't have templates. And so I think that's one of the issues that we face that it, it doesn't map very well. So what's coming in the, the future? What are some new features? If we're not going to expect Java bindings anytime soon, uh, what else can we expect? 
Yeah, so, I mean, it's a community project, right? And um, so um, what you can expect is, you know, what people implement, right? So everybody implements the sort of things that they need. Um, that That's sort of the, the, the majority of contributions that we get. And then sort of in the small circle of maintainers, there's a few projects that we want to work on. Uh, one of those is that um, we want to have parallel multigrid solvers. So when you want to solve really large problems, then multigrid is, is the best method to solve linear systems, and we need to support that in parallel. And then there's a few other finite element specific things. So something that's called the HP finite element method that we want to provide in parallel. It's, we provide it in sequential computation so far, but not in parallel. These are sort of the big things that, that we want to do. So tell us a little bit more about the community around DL2 developers and users. Yeah, that is a that is a topic that is uh, really close to our heart, um, our hearts, and um, it's it turns out that um, the the programming aspect, the software design aspect, and so on, um, moves further and further into the background. The the bigger the project um, becomes, and the more users you want to attract, and um, well, it's it's just a matter of um, trying to keep the project going. You need to attract developers that that not only use your library but actually contribute back and step up and maintain it and and help out. And uh, this has been a long process for us, and and we've we've been working quite hard in in trying to to figure out ways how to motivate people to to contribute back. And I think if I may add, I think we're actually really good at this too. That the number of people who contribute code today is vastly larger than it was five years ago. And um, I think we have a really nice supportive um, environment where people, you know, come to this project and, and participate in a, you know, joint group of learners and um, work together. And I think that works pretty well. So, guys, thank you very much for your time. Um, what's the website or email where people can contact you and find out about Deal2? It is uh, deal2.org, so D-E-A-L-I-I.org. And uh, we're running our uh, development on GitHub, so um, that's where uh, most of the things are happening. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, guys. Thank you.